uh, as we begin a new month, the month of April, and a new quarter for the year, not necessarily for church. We're not on a January, February, March quarter, but uh, for the year anyway, we've already completed the first quarter of 23. So uh, I want to continue to make the most out of the year, make the most out of this month. Here we are on April the 2nd, and uh, a busy day, a lot going on today. I hope your plans are to uh, to be with us uh, following uh, worship this morning over at Veterans Park. The congregation come together for a meal, uh, bring your own, uh, sack lunch, whatever you want to do. And then the, the little ones will be running around gathering Easter eggs. So uh, that, that's always fun. And then I think the leadership training class is later today and singing this evening at 5 p.m. So a busy day, a lot going on. Um, and we're grateful for the opportunity to be here and be a part of it. Let's uh, begin with prayer, as we always do. Do we have any specific prayer request this morning? Absolutely, certainly will. Had. I did, I did hear it. And it is the Wade family? Okay. Because I, some, someone sent a message to me and it also mentioned, uh, it could have been who shared it, the DeVito family or something. Daughter, okay. Okay. And were they members at Center Hill? Because I, I know they were at Florence Boulevard at one time. Right. Yeah, I know at Florence Boulevard at one. Sad, 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 sad story. Um, did you? Yeah. Uh, cer- certainly want to remember uh, this this family in our prayers. You said there were four children, I think. Sad, sad news, sad news. We certainly remember this family uh, in, our, in our prayers this morning. Um, Kim Powell, her surgery on the 6th, that's Margie Best, Margie Best daughter. And I um, uh, want to certainly continue to remember John's mom and Paula's grandmother in our prayers as well. Don Treadway, been praying for him up in Ohio. He's now on hospice hospice I'm not expecting him to last Doris Smith passed on Friday she passed on Friday some of you know her uh, a long time member here but uh, with health not able to uh, come to services in, in some years and she passed on Friday I believe the funeral is on Tuesday yeah, and, uh, so if you, if you knew Doris Smith she, she passed away any other uh, prayer requests Let's, uh, let's pray. Our God and Holy Father in heaven, we are grateful for the opportunity to come before your throne of grace and mercy. Uh, we're thankful, Father, for your love and your blessings, and we're thankful for the opportunity to be gathered together today for Bible study, for worship. Father, for the events that we have planned today, the church fellowship, we're thankful for times like this that would allow us to uh, spend time together outside of our regular study and worship. Father, we're grateful for our congregation here, and and we pray that in all things we'll please you and glorify you in in what we teach and how we live. Father, we pray especially at this time uh, for those that uh, we've just mentioned, especially the Wade family and and the horrific news of the accident. Help them, Father, to in, in these days and weeks and months to stay close to you. We pray for those who are recovering, that they can have a full recovery from their injuries. Help us as their church family to do all that we can to to encourage them and to help them. Heavenly Father, we uh, pray for uh, Don Treadway and ask your blessings to be upon him, that his faith will stay strong for all of his days. Father, we pray that those attending to him will do the best for him. Father, please be with the Doris Smith family at this time. Help them to find their comfort in you and 
Father, we, we are always saddened when, when uh, one leaves this, these walks of life, but we're, we rejoice when it's a brother or sister in Christ. Heavenly Father, we pray for uh, Kim's surgery this week, that all will be well with it. We pray for Margaret's recovery and that, uh, that they can get good news from her, from her procedure last week. Father, we continue to pray for the lost and those who are seeking truth. Help us to do what we can to find them and to help them as they search for truth. Bless us in our study. Keep us in your care. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so last week, what I, what I mentioned last week is that... Um, <clears throat> Take a, a couple weeks, two or three weeks. Sometimes I like to just do kind of, uh, not filler classes, but, you know, sometimes going between uh, uh, different ongoing studies. I like to just go in and, and refresh and remind, uh, especially these, these basics. And certainly, these classes need to be taught to our youth uh, over and over uh, at home and at church. Uh, on what we sometimes call the basics of the oneness of the church and salvation and worship. But we need to be reminded as well. We need to be refreshed uh, on these as well. Or it, uh, it, we, we can you know, forget. And I, I think uh, you know, at least as, from the viewpoint of one who's preparing lessons as a, a teacher in a class like this or even a preacher, you know, sometimes with some of these lessons in Bible class or sermons, in my mind, at least, sometimes I think, this is what everybody knows. They've been taught this over and over. And so I have to remind myself of the importance of going back and looking at it again, going back and refreshing from time to time on some of these, these basics that uh, uh, our salvation depends on. And, and what probably comes up most often in your day-to-day -day when you're just at work or wherever you might be and a, a Bible topic, a Bible discussion comes up. And uh, it's always good to, to be reminded and uh, prepared. They're not outlines uh, for these. However, I did fail to mention the flyers for the summer series. They are on the white tables uh, out front. You can get one of those if you're interested. That will begin the first Wednesday night in June. So let's begin once again in Acts chapter 8. We, uh, spend, you know, the book of Acts is the book of conversions. Uh, the... the it's a continuation of the Gospels, especially the book of Luke. And uh, we're reminded that uh, Luke uh, uh, wrote uh, the book of Luke and the book of Acts. So he, he's picking up in Acts 1 where, where Jesus left off uh, with the, the, the resurrection and the, the ascension into heaven. And that's where, that's where Luke picks up. So the work has now transitioned uh, into that of the Holy Spirit and the apostles. And now they are taking uh, the good news uh, to others and teaching them about Christ and Christianity. And you see a number of conversions in the book of Acts. And you see nine that are, are specific. They give a little more information, a little more detail than the others. And, and with each one, the conversion was not final, if you will, until they were baptized into Christ. So today we're going to talk about confession and baptism. Spend a little time talking about that today. Um, and something that we mentioned last week, I'll just mention again, what you'll notice in the book of Acts is they were beginning where the person was spiritually and moving from that point forward. In Acts 2, those in, uh, in Jerusalem, the Jews, they were already believers. So they began at repentance and moved forward. Uh, in Acts 16, the Philippian jailer, he had to start at step one. You know, the church was brand new in Philippi. had not ever been there before. Paul and his companions were the first ones to take the gospel to flip by and it just started probably you're, you're measuring time by days, perhaps weeks from Lydia and the women by the riverside to the jail cell that night with the Philippian jailer but this is all new to him so step one for him is hearing the word and believing of course and uh, then it moves forward to that of, of baptism. Uh, so but first of all, before we get into baptism this morning, in Acts chapter 8, verse, uh, verse 34 beginning. The eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or of some other man? Remember they just read from Isaiah and uh, the scroll of Isaiah. 
If uh, you look to your Bible, in your Bible, and you'll notice they're reading from Isaiah chapter 53. And so the eunuch, you know, he's searching scriptures. He's, he's wanting to know. He's doing what those in Berea will do once you get to Acts chapter 17. He's wanting to know, and he's going to the scriptures to know. And But, he, you know, who, who is this that Isaiah was prophesying about? And again, he's returning from Jerusalem. So that's, that's the, the crucifixion of Jesus. This guy, for those who do not believe, this guy who came in the flesh saying he's God, saying he's a king, saying he's a savior, they crucified him. And, and, and for those who are believers, he is the Lord. He is God. He is the king. And his body is there no more. So that had to be uh, the, the talk uh, in, in Jerusalem. So uh, this, uh, this one, his, this eunuch, his... His interest is piqued, certainly, uh, on this subject. So Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture preached Jesus to him. It's interesting, I think, when you look to verses 35 and 5 of Acts chapter 8, what you find is Luke does not give the, the detail to the sermon as he did with Peter's sermon back in Acts chapter 2. He just simply says... In verse 35, he preached Jesus to him. Back in verse 5 to the Samaritans, Philip preached Christ to them. Well, what comes when you preach Jesus? Verse 36, as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Well, how did the eunuch know to ask this question? The conclusion has to be when you preach Christ, you preach baptism. And I know as I said that we're... You know, we're starting with confession, and, but this all ties in together, as you know. But when you preach Christ, when you preach salvation, you preach baptism. In verse 37, Philip uh, said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So when we talk about those steps of salvation, we sometimes call them the plan of salvation. Clearly, it has to begin with this this point of hearing. You're not going to open your Bible to a book that says step one, step two, step three, step four, step five. You're not, you know. But what, you, what we do is we read it all. We put it all together. Of course, we know that the plan is found in the New Testament. So we put it all together and then the hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. You can see that's, that's the order given a couple of times, such as Acts chapter 18 and verse 8 in a proper order. But clearly, you, know, you can't believe before you hear the word of God. You cannot repent before you believe. You cannot confess. You will not confess if you do not believe unless you're doing it for some other reason, maybe to please someone else or for some other reason. Uh, but it's a confession of your belief that Jesus is the Son of God. And then ultimately the baptism, you know, for it to be done biblically, then it must be a believer repenting of sins. Quite often it's uh, taught throughout the world of Christianity. Uh, and I think because of that, a number of people in the Lord's church, probably we get this in our, in our heads that here is a confession of sin. But it's not. It's not. And uh, we need to remember what he was confessing here is his belief that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I, was, uh, I mentioned before, I believe, um, I chose jail ministry. A student at Heritage had to do uh, you know, certain ministries that were out there and active, and I chose jail ministry. And we were at the jail, and... A gentleman that I was working with studied with a guy for a long time. And I had not been a part of this study, but uh, we're going to baptize him. And uh, he asked, the brother in Christ asked for his confession. And he started confessing his sins. He said, no, 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 no. So we had to stop and slow down and talk about it a little more. And eventually the guy was, was baptized, thankfully. But it, it, it can get confusing uh, because quite often it is, it's said, you know, you confess your sins. Or the confession is asking the Lord into your heart or sinner's prayer. Any of that can be wrapped up in it. But what we see is this is a confession that you believe. You're, you're acknowledging that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Uh, that you believe that, uh, that he did come, he lived sinless, and that he, he was crucified and that he was resurrected. That's so important that we teach that when we're converting people and that we ourselves go back and remind ourselves of the, the resurrection. Now, here in Florence, Alabama, we probably don't think much about the confession. A lot of people, the majority of people, whether New Testament Christians or not, believe in God and believe in 
the, uh, the, the, the resurrection and believe that Jesus is the Son of God. But now, we go to some other countries, it's not that easy, is it? To come out and openly, verbally say, I believe in the Son of God. Studied with a lady in Romania, and uh, she, she had already studied with someone years prior, a uh, single lady in an area where the Orthodox church uh, is, is, um, uh, is just all over and controls, controls a lot. She'd already studied with someone, and she, she, from the notes that I read, she understood what she needed to do, uh, but she was not willing to do that at that time because she would lose her job just like that if she becomes a New Testament Christian. And uh, she, had a, she had a child to take care of. But she kept, you know, a, 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 a lady in the congregation, was, was, they, were, they were friends, and she kept encouraging her, kept encouraging her years passed. And just so happened, I was on that particular trip, and I was the one that studied with her, and we studied. And what had happened is the seed continued to take root. Okay. From those years, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6, Paul said, uh, I planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. That seed continued to take root. And her faith continued to grow through these years of being encouraged and studying. And so I'll never forget. Of course, we were using a translator. And, uh, but uh, as we were studying, she said, can I, get, can I get baptized and not tell anyone about it? Now, here in Florence, Alabama, we would say, why, why would you be afraid of it? Why, why wouldn't you want others to know? Why wouldn't you? Why would, and, it, and it's not to say it does not happen here. Because especially when family connection sometimes uh, would cause problems uh, for you uh, if you become a New Testament Christian. But you have to understand, this lady knew that if her, if her employers found out about this, she is done. She has no job. She has no way to take care of her, her child. I said, absolutely. Now, you might disagree with me, but I told her, I said, absolutely. We can baptize you and not tell anyone. And, and, you know, and I said, and you're in Christ, and... The, the, the Lord will bless you and we'll see what doors open. So, 4 o'clock the next morning, she and I, translator, the, 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 the lady who's a member of the church, uh, who, uh, who studied with her all these years, encouraged her all these years, uh, and maybe one or two more. Obviously, the congregation there knew what she was doing, but just a small handful. We, we met at 4 o'clock the next morning when no one else would, would, would be around. And we baptized her into Christ. Well, you see, in a situation like that, becomes a little more challenging to make that public confession, that open confession, that I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And uh, in here, of course, it would have affected her livelihood. But for some, it could affect life itself, could it not? Death, even. And I could tell you story after story, a, a, a guy in Burma who became a Christian, and his family, uh, they, they don't have anything to do with him anymore but he's still faithful today. A lady in Burma, her husband said, if you become a Christian, now they're leaving the Buddhist faith. You know, they're not just leaving denominational Christianity, they're leaving the Buddhist faith. And her husband said, you're gone. And she did it. She became a Christian. And she was left with three young children on her own to take care of. So that's stuff that we have to think about when we go back to the Bible. We don't need to always limit it to what is in our area and what we know. We have to kind of think about uh, all that's going on, but we see this confession uh, is a confession that you do believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and uh, that you do believe in the resurrection. Now, once you're into Christ, as we saw earlier in Acts chapter 8 with Simon the sorcerer, once you're in Christ, then we have that blessing of being able to confess sins and pray to God for forgiveness. That's when that, there is, is there such thing as a sinner's prayer? Absolutely. We just must apply it right. It's a baptized sinner praying for forgiveness. Not for your sins prior to baptism. All of those were washed away at baptism, Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. But for sins that have come after baptism, we repent of them and we pray to God for forgiveness. We just have to have the order. We have to have the proper order. And once you are a New Testament child of God, then you can, then you can confess sin to God and, and, and pray for forgiveness. But, but uh, prior to it, of course, you're confessing your belief that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Look to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. <clears throat> verse 9. Chapter 10 and verse 9. That if you confess with your mouth the 
Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. So here again, this is the resurrection. And this, I, I, I probably told this story here before, but this is just a reminder of why I think it's important, even in classes like this, to go back and refresh and remember. Uh, I, 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 some years ago, I went with, uh, with a group over to Emory in Atlanta. They had the Dead Sea Scrolls there. And we, uh, we toured that. And I purchased a book, um, and it just, you know, of course, had different information in there and, and, and pictures, and archaeological sites and everything. And, and, and one of them was a, a bone of someone who had been crucified. The, the nail was still in, in the bone. And, you know, crucifixion was common in that time. Our Lord was not the only person to be crucified. That was, that was a common uh, way of execution uh, by the Romans. And, you know, uh, I was showing it uh, to, to people at church, and uh, a lady who I, I hope maybe just, you know, kind of spoke before thinking, said, could this be our Lord's, our Lord's bone? Do we know? Could this be Jesus? Well, there's no way whatsoever because <laughs> his bones are not there. He was resurrected. But you see, that's what we need to remember is, is, is this, this confession is we, we believe uh, not only that Jesus is God, not only that he's our Lord and Savior, but we believe the resurrection. Uh, and that's what he says in verse, uh, verse 9. And he says in verse 10, For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So, so we need to, again, just make sure we have the proper order. This is a, we believe in the resurrection. We're, we're admitting it when we, when we confess it. Uh, we're helping others to believe in this resurrection through a study of the Word of God and making that confession that they believe uh, in the resurrection. And then from that point, moving on to baptism. Uh, a certain space that very much taken advantage of by the Catholic Church as far as the one example I think I remember from friends of mine telling me about is the, uh, there's some church somewhere that has the skull of John the Baptist as a boy. Oh, sure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Out, out there in the world of Christianity, in, in every religion has it. Every religion has it. Um, you know, within Christianity, this, as mentioned, some, uh, claiming to have the skull of John the Baptist as a boy. Uh, of course, claiming to have um, Peter's bones, um, the ark, you name it, and somebody has it. Uh, I think it was, it was either, it was, I think it was Martin Luther, the one who nailed the 95-page thesis. He was a Catholic priest and broke away from them. And I think it was he in one of his uh, books, he said there were 12 apostles and you can find where all 20 of them are buried. Well, tourism attraction, of course, you know, and, and uh, people want people to pay. Oh, this is where Peter was buried or so forth and so on. And so, but yeah, that, that, that does come up quite often. And, and I, again, I was in Burma and um, there are a number of their different pagodas, temple, what we would think of them as. And, you know, different ones. Um, one of them, for example, there's a tooth. That, I mean, this thing is locked down and guarded, but you can see it that was believed to, to you know, be the, from hundreds, even thousands of years ago from one of their, their Buddhist monks or something like that. So that, that's kind of the nature of, of people when we kind of get away on our, on our own way and our own, own, own way of doing things. We just we see the same thing happen across religion. So uh, any, any thoughts or comments about confession um, can, or, and what we're confessing or confessing the confession before baptism versus the confession after baptism. Any, any thoughts or comments about that? Okay, so baptism, of course, we, we talked last week about hearing and believing and repenting. Um, and then we see, let's just stay in Acts 8 while we're there. And uh, then we'll, we'll notice some other, uh, other chapter, other verses in the book of Acts. Uh, but again, uh, Remember, you find nine specific, and if you're taking notes, they're the Jews in Acts chapter 2. They were baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Uh, they were the, uh, the Samaritans in Acts chapter 8. Now, others were baptized between 2 and 8 that you read about, but these are the specific accounts where it gives a little more detail. So you see verses 12 and 13, the Samaritans and Simon were baptized. The one we're talking about now, the eunuch, we find him being baptized into Christ. So that's three. Saul of Tarsus in Acts chapter 9, he's baptized into Christ. That's number 4. That story is told again in chapters 22 and 26 of Acts. 
Number five would be um, the, the uh, Gentiles, Cornelius and the Gentiles in Acts 10. Then you have Lydia in Acts chapter 16, as well as uh, the jailer in Acts chapter 16. That's where the beginning of the church of uh, Philippi is recorded. And then you have in Acts chapter 18, the beginning of the church at Corinth, when Crispus and others were baptized. And then at the end of chapter 18, the beginning of chapter 19, in Ephesus, the beginning of the church at Ephesus. So you, you see these specific accounts were all include baptism. So, you know, the eunuch, if you go back to our text, the eunuch asked this question, what hinders me from being baptized? Now, a couple of things that we learned from this text is, you know, the church was not there, as is commonly believed that you're saved, but then you're baptized later to show your faith. Well, there was no congregation there. They were just out on their own, just them. Um, so he was not showing his faith to anyone, as you see earlier in this chapter, as you see with Paul and Ananias in chapter 9, and on and on we can go. So this was not a showing of the faith. This was not saved before bab being baptized or anything like that. We see the, necess the necessity of it uh, in that they did it right then because he did confess in verse 37 and verse 38. So he commanded the chariots to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Well, we also learn a little bit about uh, they, it was an immersion. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, as well as Colossians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, would teach that it's a burial. So it's not just a little water over the head or sprinkling or anything like that. And we learn it's a, it's a burial. They both went into the water. Philip baptized the eunuch. So there was enough. Remember when John the baptizer was baptizing, uh, there was, he was, chose the place where he was baptizing because there was much water there. He remember, had, had enough water to, to, to bury people. Now it's common today that our church buildings have baptistries, but we're not limited to baptizing in baptistries. Uh, it can be done anywhere that there's enough water uh, to, to immerse. Um, baptize in baptistry, baptistry, swimming pools, oceans, lakes. Tried to in a bathtub one night, a man who was, who was uh, not well. Uh, but we could not get, get the water deep enough, so we ended up taking him uh, to the church building. Baptized the lady some years ago. Um, she had not been able to walk in years. But she studied and learned the truth, and she wanted to become a Christian. So the, at this uh, nursing home, they assisted us. And it, thankfully, it was a warm, pretty day, and they filled up a container large enough outside. And they wheeled her out there in a wheelchair, and with a lift, they lowered her down into the water and below the water and back up using a lift. Uh, uh, Anthony and I, what, two others, that lady in Costa Rica, she was in poor health, did not live much longer, a year or two uh, past uh, that point than when we baptized her, but uh, we went to a creek and we had to find an area that was deep enough to get her in it, but again, her health, uh, I think she had MS, I believe, among other problems, but there were four of us because we had to be careful and gentle with her to, to get her under the water and, and back up. So, so Sometimes it calls for, uh, for, for that. Uh, but we see that Philip and the eunuch both went into the water. So we, we learned that, uh, again, putting it together for Romans chapter 6, Colossians chapter 2, it's a burial, baptism, immersion under the water and, uh, for the forgiveness of sins. We also learned that this eunuch, you know, he had the ability to choose for himself. Um, one of the verses that we could look at uh, to teach that, you know, it's someone who must be of the mental age to... To, to, to make his own decision or her own decision. You know? So it's, it's not, for, not for babies, not for infants or anything like that. Um, they have to be able to, to, uh, to make their own decision uh, in the matter. And uh, here was a, a, this eunuch. He, he said, I believe. He heard it. He believed it. And he chose to be baptized. And that's something I think we have to keep in mind when we're studying with other people. We want to encourage them. We want to, to, to persuade. Paul talks about persuading. Uh, sometimes, you know, the, the, the more you know about a person that, or the, the way the study is going, sometimes you just need that, that, little, that little extra push. I told you when we baptized my dad here a few weeks ago on that night, he and I had been talking and studying a little for a few hours. And it, I, I, it, I told you, you know, actually I called her to close her. She just came in and said, just do it. Just go do it, you know. And so she, she had been listening in and knew enough to, to say, go do it, you know. So she, he, that, that little extra push uh, of encouragement. 
with that being said, we do have to be careful that we're not pushing someone beyond what they're ready to do and, and make sure that they, they have an, uh, an understanding and, uh, of what they're doing and that they want to do it to get into the body of Christ. We see in Col- uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, of course, that baptism is what uh, uh, puts you into the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12, for the body is one and it has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. So you see here Paul writing to the church at uh, Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And again, you tie that together with the beginning of the church. And I, this is why it's so important to study the book of Acts. Because all of these other books tie into it. So Paul reminding the church at Corinth that we're all bad. Because what was the, what was the major problem at Corinth? There were a lot of problems. But what, what was the kind of the root problem? It was division. And that was leading into all these other problems. So throughout this book, Paul's having to remind them, you're one, you're one, you're one. And, and that's why you get to chapter 12 and he reminds them, you know, we're all baptized into one body. Well... You go back to the very beginning of this church in Acts chapter 18. When Paul is in Corinth, you see in verse 8, Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. I saw a thing, uh, a little article, uh, I think it was in House to House, an, an, an issue that just came out called H- HBO, <laughs> something uh, HBO. We always think of the television network, but hear, believe, obey. And I thought that was interesting to take that take on it and that's what they're doing here in verse uh, 8 hear believe and baptize or, or obey so uh, we see that uh, it's what puts you into the body of Christ it's where Jesus saves us Acts chapter 2 and verse 47 it's when the Lord adds you to his church so uh, I can easily go on and on but I want to make sure are there any particular thoughts or comments about Baptism uh, as we continue to discuss this this subject. That really strikes me, and that is, uh, you know, I, I don't know that I've heard folks uh, talk a whole lot about about why it is, um, you know, when, when you're baptized, uh, you know, why why someone has to assist you with that, and. Uh, Romans uh, chapter 6 and other places, I think really they said it wasn't even clear and then in the Gospels when Jesus is uh, uh, disciples like baptizing in uh, John, uh, the baptizer is uh, coming before Christ doing uh, and teaching the Gospel of Repentance and, and, and he's baptizing people as much water but the, in Romans chapter 6 you know, the scriptures are very clear about whole connection with Christ. We were buried with Christ in baptism. We were raised to walk in the biggest life. And, uh, and just one very simple thing that we all understand. The dead don't bury themselves. Sure. And so when we die uh, you know, to ourselves, to be born again, uh, you know, we, don't, we don't bury ourselves. Someone has to bury us sure. uh, into Christ. Then we're raised to walk in the new life. Great, great point about, you know, why the, the assistance, you know, because, again, sometimes people will say that. And, you know, why, why, why does someone else have to take part in your salvation and baptize you and, and, and do that? Of course, you see the, that, that as being the example in, in the Bible. But uh, I, I never thought of that comment, the dead do not bury themselves. And so other, someone else would bury us into Christ. Uh, uh, great, great point there. And it's, it's always encouraging to tie Romans 6 into 1 Corinthians 15. we see Jesus was, was, he, was died, he died, he was buried in rose again when well, we die to our sins we're buried in baptism we rise again to walk in the newness of life and and and, and yeah certainly uh, certainly you, you see that so it was the the Campbells Thomas and Alexander Campbell which you know for many years uh, you know people love to accuse us of as being Campbellites and, and not even Campbellites but Camelites <laughs> you probably have heard that at some point in in your lifetime but you know they the, the, the two of them were uh, when you read uh, some about uh, uh, Thomas and Alexander Campbell you know they they were baptized, I think, at least three times because they were coming out of the Presbyterian 
church and they were learning all of this in, in some ways for the first time as they were just going back to the Bible. And so as they would continue to learn a little more, they would want to go back and make sure they were doing it right. And, uh, you know, it's a blessing in this day and time that, that we're standing on the shoulders of those in what we you know, refer to the beginning of the restoration movement and those who have continued on through the years. You know, we're standing on their shoulders and all their study and all their hours to, uh, to, to we, we're already had a great starting point. We just have to continue with it, you know, but my understanding is they would learn a little bit about baptism and then, and then, you know, as they learn a little more, say, oh, we, you know, this, this is it, you know, and so, you know, there's these, there's these, these, these steps of it is a burial, it is for a believer, you know, and so forth and so on. So you see them wanting to do it right, and I think it was the case that um, maybe the first time uh, that they actually wanted a, a Presbyterian minister to, to, to administer New Testament baptism and was not willing to do so, and they discussed that and eventually was willing to do so or something like that. So, um, you know, and, 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 and you've, you've heard of stories like this before, uh, uh, no doubt, uh, in stories like this. Ultimately, we have to make sure we're doing it according to the New Testament scriptures and that we know what we're doing and we're doing it according to the Great Commission, Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. I don't preach often on rebaptism because I think a lot of people would get rebaptized. But I do think it's important to, I, I think in preaching about baptism itself for one who is continuing to search the scriptures, then sometimes maybe it would click, oh, what, was I really baptized the right way? And um, you do have an example in Acts chapter 19 of those who were not baptized the right way. So they had to go back and do it again. So I think it's important to mention it from time to time. Um, and and I'll, I'll, I'll say this, if you have children or grandchildren, some of the best advice I ever heard was um, when they start talking about baptism and um, start asking questions and you're not really sure, you know, that they really understand they're old enough, to have them, when you do allow the baptism, have them write down everything they're thinking right then. Or just go and write, it, write everything they're feeling because then years later when they start questioning, you know, why was I baptized? You can just pull that out and say, well, this is what you were thinking. This is what was on your mind the night that you were, or the day that you were baptized, whatever the case may be. And so that, that uh, I, I thought that was really good advice um, there um, with that. Any other th uh, thoughts or, or, or comments um, about baptism? Question? Romans chapter 6 and that understanding that we've died to sin and that's what, that's what this rebirth is all about. Great, And that's the, the focus of Paul. He's, you know, the, the Bible's amazing in that something can be written for our benefit. We learn that baptism is a barrier but also for, for another benefit in that what the focus was here he's saying because you've been baptized, because you've died to sin, you must live faithful. And, and, and uh, we, we see that and that's certainly true for us today. And, uh, you know, you've heard me say before, we need to be careful to not convert people to baptism. We need to convert them to the Lord and His church. Now, baptism is essential to getting into it, but help them understand that it's not just about the baptism. Uh, if it were, then uh, the Bible would teach once saved, always saved. It's about living faithful for the rest of life. Someone said this. 
Let's see. Oh, check, I have it written in my Bible, actually. <laughs> Tex Williams. Um, I think he passed just a few years ago. But in, in, in John chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, where Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, and he says, you know, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus, you know, how can a man be born? And verse 5, Jesus said, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Tex Williams said, becoming a Christian is so complete, it means being born again. And that's the conversation going with we're just discussing Romans chapter 6. It's so complete. You don't do it accidentally. It's so complete. You are born again. And uh, just a beautiful thought, of course, here Jesus is talking about the water and the spirit in John chapter 3 in, uh, in verse 5. We have just a minute or two left. And, oh, yes. Did were the fuck? Oh, they used John's baptism. I have John's baptism. They were laying that house. Right, okay, so, so the Jews, remember John came baptizing uh, Jews only, Mark chapter 1. So he was baptizing Jews only, and it was an immersion, it was an immersion. But, you know, Jews were already born into the family of God, descendants of Abraham. But John was preparing, uh, preparing the way. So John's baptism did serve uh, for a period of time. Uh, remember, John died before Jesus. John was beheaded in prison before Jesus so that baptism uh, was, was done away before um, Jesus went to the cross when, you know, John, John baptized. Uh, so that, that baptism was already done away when Jesus went to the cross. Uh, that's, that's why with the, the thief on the cross, for example, um, you can say for sure he was not baptized according to the Great Commission baptism. Now, he might have been baptized according to John's baptism, but uh, he was not baptized according to the Great Commission baptism because he died before it was established. Uh, so when you see in Acts chapter 2, uh, in Acts chapter 2, you see people being baptized. I believe they had to be baptized according to the Great Commission baptism to get into Christianity. I think what you find in Acts chapter 19 is people who were baptized according to John's baptism after the Great Commission baptism was in effect. Because remember, Apollos back in Acts chapter 18 he was teaching the baptism of John. And that's why Aquila and Priscilla took him to the side to explain to him the word of God more accurately. So he probably baptized them after the church started. Uh, in Acts 19? Or, 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 or the just the Jews in general? Well, I mean, in that story of Aquila and Priscilla, it doesn't mention that they read baptized them. It says that he was teaching them. Right, right. I think there the inference would be that he did because when you get into chapter 19, you see that Paul does rebaptize those, those, uh, those men. Uh, yeah, in, in Acts 19, in the first seven verses, you see that Paul, the, 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 was it 12 men? I think you see that Paul does rebaptize those people. Now, I believe they were baptized in John's baptism after the New Testament baptism. Great Commission. I believe he, he baptized them after the church was established. And the Great Commission baptism was in effect. Now, as far as those, as those that uh, we see having been baptized according to John's baptism when it was still in effect, you know, I kind of think that they, they too, once from Acts 2 forward, had to be baptized according to the Great Commission baptism. Yeah. So, thank you so much. I appreciate your thoughts and comments. I appreciate the last couple of weeks in, in this discussion. Again, I, just, I, I like to go back and refresh from time to time. We'll have a quick break. Come back at the top of the hour for our worship.